Hi again. I am back with brief lecture number two. And in this lecture, we're going to talk about innovation and sustainability. But before we get into that, I just want to remind you about something that we ended off in, in brief lecture number one. We talked about these dimensions of environmental uncertainty, the rate of change, as well as the level of complexity. And we said that in this area right here, where most firms or many firms are finding themselves in today's society, in today's environment, there is high uncertainty. And what that requires is great flexibility, as it says, then adaptation. Essentially, it requires firms to do things in a new way, to produce new products, and to find new ways of operating. And all of this new gets us to this point of innovation, which is simply the process of putting new ideas into practice. Putting new ideas into practice. This is also tied to the concept of competitive advantage that we saw in brief lecture one. The firms with competitive advantages are those that are doing things in new and unique ways. That is what gives you superiority over your competitors. And so the different types of innovation, there are three that we can look at, the product innovation, process innovation, and business model innovation. I'll talk about these briefly. Product innovation is simply the creation of new products and services. That's the one that we're probably most familiar with. So for example, when Nike brings out a new Air Jordan, uh, when Apple brings out a new iPhone, when uh, restaurants bring out new things on their menu, that's a product innovation. That's again something new, something unique, something that hasn't been done before. And that product innovation is often rewarded by creating greater value, meaning that customers are willing to pay a little more for something new. We desire, we value that innovation, that product innovation, creating new products and services. What is process innovation? Well, it's not necessarily creating new products or services, but it's creating new ways to either manufacture, sell, market, something in the supply chain, something about our operations, new ways of operating our business practices. So it's that's process innovation. So if you want to think of uh, uh, examples of process innovation, I can tell you one, the just-in-time. Just-in-time is a management technique that many firms have used to increase, I'm sorry, to decrease their inventory cost. Okay, so you get your supplies and the, the, the products and, and, and raw materials move through the, the, the process in such a way that it reduces wasted time and also it reduces the need for much buffer in inventory. And that's a process innovation that's really helped firms to change the way that they produce and to reduce their inventory costs. Another example of a process innovation could probably be seen in terms of online or e-commerce. Many firms now offer the ability for their customers to shop online and thereby that has expanded their market and has given them a new and unique way to market and sell their products and services. So that's a process innovation, new ways of doing business operations. But what is a business model innovation? Well, that is essentially a new way of creating or doing business. It is a whole and revolutionary way, if you will, of conducting business, of meeting a need in the environment. So if you think of example, an example would be eBay. Before eBay, if you wanted to get stuff, use stuff, you go to a garage sale, as I said, you go to an auction house, but eBay changed and transformed that. Now many times you're looking for something, you go straight to eBay or types of marketplaces like that. That was a business model innovation. It was a dramatic and drastic new way of doing business. They were not just adapting the existing way. They were not just getting a new product in the existing operations or changing parts of the existing operations that we might do in process innovation. But in the business model innovation, the organization was looking at creating an absolutely new way to do business, to meet the demands of the environment. Okay, so those are three examples of business innovations. Another noteworthy example of business innovation is this idea of social you know, business innovation. And what that is, is the, the intersection between business innovation 
and social needs or sustainability. So in this way, firms are not only looking for new ways of operating business, but they are also trying to or attempting in these new business models to serve some specific social need or to address some specific social problem. So if an example of this may be Tom's, and in terms of Tom's shoes, some of you know that when you purchase a pair of Tom's shoes, that the organization gives or donates a pair of shoes to a needy child in different parts of the world. So this is a social business innovation because one, it's a new business model. The firm is attempting to, of course, create competitive advantage and to be profitable. But in doing so, the firm is also trying to address this social problem in terms of poverty, in terms of poverty. So that's social business innovation. It ties this concept of the firm being profitable and being new and being unique with this idea of being sustainable. And we're going to see that a little bit later. The innovation process is somewhat intuitive, and I think you can conceptualize it, but let's just go through it so we have an idea. The first stage is, of course, imagination. Imagination, imagining, this is where our new ideas, new way of thinking comes from. And we obviously have to imagine, we have to be creative if we're going to do things in a new, unique, or better way. So when the designer of, let's say, Facebook or, 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 or Twitter or any one of these new apps, that person has to think differently from what is already in existence. So new ideas have to be created. Once these ideas are conceptualized, they, however, must be formalized, uh, formalized, I should say. And that happens to the designing phase. It takes the ideas and creates some type of tangible entity, something that addresses and represents that idea in a tangible way. That's the design phase. A lot of times you'll hear uh, the term prototype, where organization, my car companies do, do that a lot, and also you know, shoe companies, they will create a design, an initial design from the ideas of the people in the organizations that came up or created the ideas. And after that, once it's designed, it's then experimented upon, meaning that it goes out and people use it. Some people use it. You hear the term focus group, groups. Often now, for example, with the Google Glasses, Google has sent out that product to a few experts in the area to kind of get their ideas about what works and maybe what doesn't work. So that's the level of experimentation. And of course, it's limited because the firm has not really addressed the question or has not fully addressed the question on whether it can sell this product or not. So it's just simply trying to see, okay, is it practical? And is also, is it perhaps financially feasible? And then once it experiments, it can then get a better grasp on, okay, is this product going to work? Or is this design going to work? What do we need to change? What are the strengths? What also are the weaknesses? What are the costs associated with this? And also the advantages. And then once it assesses that, it can then actually implement it, scale it and make it commercialized, meaning that it can now be sold to the general public, okay? So that's the innovation process in a nutshell. And the last thing I want to look at in terms of the innovation process is this idea of reverse innovation. This idea of reverse innovation is heavily tied to something that we've seen before in chapter one. If you remember the bottom-up pyramid that spoke about the fact that no longer do we see top management as being the be-all, end-all when it comes to ideas, when it comes to planning, when it comes to the way organizations are run. In fact, customers now are the ones that motivate organizations. So that's the bottom-up approach versus the top down down command and control. And a reverse innovation, this just builds upon that, meaning that we see innovation as being a part and parcel of the entire organization. And therefore, innovation and ideas can come from any level in your organization, from the lowest level in the hierarchy, all of, uh, all of um, excuse me, to the very top of the organization. It could come from anywhere and it could come from any part of the organization. So even with multinational, transnational corporations that have operations in multiple countries, ideas can come from anywhere, from any part of the organization or from any location in the organization. Okay, So that reverse in innovation is really, really highly correlated with the bottom-up approach and it builds upon that concept. The last thing that we're going to look at before we end this brief lecture too, is sustainability. 
And we've talked again about sustainability in chapter 3 and a little bit in chapter 1. And what is it? It says, commitment to protect the rights of present and future generations as co-stakeholders of present-day natural resources. What this suggests that as individuals, human beings living on the earth right now, we have some rights to the natural resources that are present. But with those rights come a responsibility to not only use those resources effectively in order to help us be successful, but to protect those resources that because they will be required and necessary for future generations. So we must be committed to protecting the rights of those individuals that are not here presently to speak for themselves. We must protect those rights and ensure that they have the resources and the opportunities to be as successful, even more successful than we are. So it is operating today with a perspective for the future, a concern and a perspective for the future. And that is why many firms are uh, investing in sustainable development. And in sustainable development, they're making use of resources today, but in order to support societal needs for the future as well. So you're using resources today, but with an eye towards the future, the future requirements, the future needs. And that has led many firms to, of course, do things like recycling, reduce their carbon footprint, um, reduce their level of pollution, get involved in all types of processes that either decrease the number of alternative energies, decrease the level of natural resources that they require in order to operate, and also to be more mindful and more efficient in terms of the resources that they do use. So that is sustainable development, investing in today for today's success as well as the success of future generations. And that is obviously tied to the environmental capital. Environmental capital, natural resources that we have, that we use to produce goods and services, the land, the water, and minerals. We want to protect that capital and we want to enhance it because we want to give our future generations better lives than even we have today. And that obviously is all tied to this concept of the triple bottom line. And we've seen this before, especially in Chapter 3. The three P's of performance, not only are firms concerned with the, the traditional profit uh, margin, which is the financial measure, but they're also concerned with people, with social advancement, human capital, the well-being of health, sorry, the health and well-being of, of, of individuals, and of course, the planet. The planet meaning the natural environment, the resources that we are endowed with. And where those three intersect is where firms are attempting to find and locate their business operations in order to be, again, successful, effective today, but sustainable for the future.